Welcome back. In the last video, we looked at matchmaking in Fish Game. In this video, we're going to look at spawning players. So you saw previously that when we received our matchmaking match event, we actually went through and called the spawn player function. I'm going to dive in this video how we're actually spawning those players and some of the differences between a local player and a remotely connected player. So let's dive into the code here. Let's open up our game manager script. And let's go to our matchmaker matched event handler. You can see here that when we receive our match, we are looking to spawn each player that is connected to this particular match. So we loop through the match presences and we spawn a player for that connected user. So in here, we pass in the match ID and we also pass in the I user presence object as well. Let's dive into the spawn player function. Okay, so the first thing we can see here is we're saying, has this player already been spawned? So we actually have a list up the top here. So let's just dive up to the top of this script to have a look at that. We have an I dictionary, which has a set of string keys, and each of those has a game object value assigned to it. And then we call that players. So let's come back down to our spawn function here. Let's just find the call. Let's go down to it. So we're basically saying if our players dictionary already has a reference to this user's session ID, then we're just going to return. We've already got a game object for that player, so we're not going to create them a new one. So we just return out of this function early. The next little bit of code here is nothing really to do with Nakama. Basically, all we're saying here is we are looking for a particular spawn index if one has been passed to this function. If it hasn't, we're going to choose a spawn from random from the map. And if one has been passed in, then we're going to specifically spawn them at that location. Our next little bit here is we're going to set a local variable, which is basically saying, is this user our current user? So we're determining that based off the user's session ID. So if it is, then we're going to do something slightly different for our local user versus a user that has come in and is remotely connected. Now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to choose a different prefab depending on whether or not it's our player or a player's object that has been remotely connected. And when I say that, I mean another player that is connected in the match that isn't specifically yourself. So let's say we have our own local player. We're going to spawn the network local player prefab. And if it's somebody else's player object, we're going to spawn the network remote player prefab. And I'll dive into that a little bit later in this video. The next thing we do is we instantiate that player prefab at the particular spawn location with just the standard quaternion.identity rotation. And also we're saying if this isn't our local player, then we're going to try and get the player remote sync, player network remote sync component, and we're going to set up some network data on that. And what we're going to add there is the match ID and the user. Let's just quickly dive into this remote player network data. It's a very simple class, and the reason it's here is that for any user that is connected remotely, we need to make sure that we have a reference to their I user presence object so that we can make sure any network requests that are coming through, we can match it to the correct game object to update its player position and velocity, for example. And we also have a reference to the current match ID as well. So let's go back into our spawn function. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add this player to our player's dictionary. We're going to give it the user's session ID and also the player object that we've actually instantiated. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to say if this is our local player, then we're going to get a reference to that. We're going to store that at the top of the game manager script just so that we've got easy access to our own player object. And then we're going to get the player health controller component. And we're going to add an event listener to the player died event. And that's just going to allow us here to do some things when our own player dies. Basically tell everybody else, hey, we died. Go and update your own games accordingly. And then we're going to remove our own player from the scene. And that's going to allow us to respawn at a later time. So let's quickly jump back into our Unity project here. And I just want to quickly show you the differences between those two player prefabs. If we come over to our assets here and go into entities player, you can see that if we scroll down, we've got our network local player and our network remote player. Let's dive into network local player. 
So you can see here that inside this, we have a fairly basic hierarchy. And the only thing that sits underneath this is the actual player prefab itself. Let's dive into the player prefab real quick. You can see that this has our body, fin, weapon, footstep particles. Basically, this is just the generic player prefab that has all of the movement code, all of the weapon code, its color code, anything that is specifically related to just the player. It has no idea or no concept of any sort of networking. It's just a player object that knows how to handle its own movement and firing weapons. Let's go back into the network local player. The first thing we have here is the player network local sync component. And we're going to dive into that a little bit later, so I won't go into too much detail here, but it's basically responsible for telling everybody else all the information they need to know about this particular player. The next is the player input controller component, and that's going to allow this prefab to be controlled using the keyboard and mouse. The next one is the player health controller. Now this is responsible for taking damage and then notifying when this player has been killed. The reason we have this on the local player and we don't have this on the remote players is that each local client is responsible in this particular game for telling everyone else when they've taken damage or when they've died. Now that's known as client authoritative. In a MMO, for example, you would want to have a server authoritative model where you know the clients aren't dictating what's happening to themselves. It's actually the server that is in control. But in this instance, we're using a client authoritative model, which means that each client is basically responsible for saying, hey, I took damage or hey, I died. And the next one is we have our player camera controller. That's simple enough. It basically just handles the camera to make sure it's looking at this particular object. OK, let's dive into the network remote player prefab. And you can see here that this one is much simpler. So the only thing we have here is the player network remote sync component. And that one is basically going to take in any network requests that are coming into this client that are specifically related to this player object. And it's just going to update it. So it's going to update all of its movement. It's going to update its attacking state, whether or not it's firing the weapon. And it's also going to handle prediction and interpolation of that particular player's position and velocity. We'll dive into that in a later video. And that's it for this one. In the next one, we're going to look at how we actually send some of those status messages across the network using our simple Nakama demo. And then following that, we'll go into how we do it in Fish Game. So I'll see you there.